until you get done. We're going to reconvene um, the recessed uh, work session from last Monday. I think it was Monday, right? Um, and uh, I think there are some amendments to be heard again. Um, um, I couldn't get mine done in enough time, so um, I, I will, we can talk about it. Okay. Because um, I, I spoke with um, Representative Bryce yesterday, so. All right, so. So, so the amendment that I have to bring forward actually incorporates the changes that uh, Representative Carson discussed in relation to her um, amendment and some of my own, and I could pass that out for all of you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, See, I, I, don't, I don't have the same poll as she does, so. You know how that goes. I think it was poll. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Anthony's just been incredibly busy, so he just, he just, could, he just couldn't get done for today. Okay, once again, I'll just take a couple of minutes to look through this. Yes, you can see the name of and I discussed that no matter, well, for, for those who weren't here last time, um, just a reminder about Representative Carson's amendment, which proposed um, adding legislative members to the Homeschool Advisory Council and setting up a further commission that would review the homeschool statute and would, be, uh, would consist of members from the legislature the homeschool community and the Department of Education, although that was an addition that needed to be made because the only was not originally yes. listed. So Representative Carson and I discussed that no matter um, that what should come forward in any amendment that we eventually pass would include the notification provisions. And we did make some adjustments to that notification provision. So yeah. section one, Roman one A says any parent commencing a home education program would notify, and instead of saying uh, um, prior to commencement of the program, since we had testimony that there might be possible emergency situations in which a parent would not have that kind of lead time, it now reads within five business days of commencing the program. And we did talk at length about what kind of time frame was reasonable, we were concerned with truancy issues where a parent might, um, where a child might actually be truant from school, but a parent might sort of cover up for that situation by claiming to be homeschooling, but they just hadn't gotten around to notifying yet. Truancy goes into effect after 20 half days. So the five business days seemed like the most reasonable. And we were also concerned about length of time missing school if, in fact, there was a truancy issue involved. So we were trying to give enough time for someone to make up their mind that they were at least going to not notify that they were commencing a program, but not so much time that a child would miss too much school. Um, and then uh, Roman 1b remains as it was in the original bill that parents continuing the home education program would notify. Um, the Next change. Now, this is the first time I'm seeing the final revised amendment myself, so I have to kind of find my way through here. Um, Roman 5a is the new language that we saw um, in the amendment I brought in on Monday about it no longer talks about a draft plan, it just says which summarizes a plan of supervised instruction. And following the conversation um, on Monday, I added an or, the, the option of having a discussion with the same people who would, um, who the plan would be submitted to, either the Department of Education, a resident district superintendent, or the principal of a non-public school. 
so the meeting to discuss a plan of supervised instruction and age appropriate expectations and resources um, pursuant to the RSA about the subject areas. And it's the same language about at the time of notification or within 30 days of the notification. So the idea behind um, that alternative, as Representative Price said, if our goal was to encourage communication and if we are not confident that communication occurs around the submission of a written plan, this seemed like an alternative, but it also allowed parents to have some choice. Um, Roman 6A, I, yes, so I wanted to address issues of exemptions that people raised and be very specific since it was felt that the language in the, in the proposed bill was vague. So <coughs> 6A provides an exemption um, for <coughs> parents who are continuing in a home education program or who are beginning um, but with another child in the family. So in, in either case, they would not have to submit a plan unless the annual evaluation results um, were not satisfactory. I mean, it seemed only reasonable to me that <coughs> a family was in trouble with their evaluation results, that some kind of planning um, should be part of the, the probation period in the next year. So that covers A and B. And, and yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that I'm hearing you correctly. Are you saying that this creates no a probation period? No, there is already, um, and I don't have this, I should have brought the statute book in, but if someone does not meet that 40% um, benchmark in the evaluation results, they are in fact sort of in a probationary period and they have to, um, the, the following year, if the if the evaluation results are still not satisfactory, there's a provision for a hearing. Okay, so I'm saying that if if a family fell into either of those categories, if the, in the first year that they had um, not had satisfactory evaluation results, then that fall they should be expected to submit a plan or have a discussion about it. Okay, so you're taking away that because what I'm hearing you saying is that. In year, say in year one, they failed to meet the 40%. So they've got until the next go through another testing cycle, and if they're not doing, there's no improvement at that point, then something happens. So are you now saying that the first time that they fail to meet the 40%, that's when they have to go and submit, submit a plan? plan? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I am. I mean, it seems only reasonable if someone is struggling to meet their, to have satisfactory evaluation results. So some help around the plan to improve makes sense. So let, let me okay. just continue. Um, Roman uh, five, six, seven. Line, I'm line seventeen and eighteen on page mm -hmm. two. Specifically addresses the flexibility issue that people were concerned about. Uh, Roman 8 specifically addresses the fact that the people who receive the plan have no role in the approval or rejection of the plan. Um, and the rest of the bill, I think, is Representative Carson's language about adding members to the Advisory Council and um, setting up mm -hmm the uh, study commission. I want to make sure that the DOE was added. I'm not sure. Yeah, at the, on the, if you look on um, page 3, uh, line 17, uh, commission established, you'll see that on line 25, it says one member from the Department of Education. Right, okay. There we go. So, I bring this before you for your consideration. I attempted to address the concerns that were raised. Um, it, did, it does occur to me, you know, that the argument that we should leave it all for a time when everyone's at the table, 
might be answered by the fact that we have all been at the table now for several days of meeting together and hearing concerns expressed around this and that this has attempted to address those concerns. So I, I think it's not inappropriate to move forward with that one piece and then to continue dialogue um, with the provisions Representative Carson has put in place. Question, um, when you were talking about, um, I think it starts at the bottom of page one, line 33, the part B, the um, discussion part. Uh, you mentioned in there that it gives the parent choice, and I just wanted to ask you, I wasn't sure what you meant by that. Um, I, I'm referring to the fact that in line 32 on page one, at the end of the provision about submitting a written plan, it said it ends with or they could meet. And so the choice would be between the written plan or the meeting. It doesn't say that uh, or be prior as provided shall meet with the commission. Okay. So they can either do that or meet. Right. Okay. Okay. I just I wasn't sure if you is there any reporting requirement for that meeting? In other words, would the um, uh, the district or the or the private school have to report that they met? That was discussed and did not end up in here. We could add something to that effect. How, how would you suggest it should occur? I I don't know. I mean, I I'm just concerned now that. We're putting more and more and more here on the table. Um, I, I, I find that to be problematic. I'm not sure how to, the best way to do that. And you might have difficulty with a parent who um, cannot, for whatever reason, because of a, a disagreement with the superintendent, or there might not be a, we don't have a lot of non-public schools here in New Hampshire, and they might not have a, um, a non-public principal available um, in their area, they might have to travel quite a distance. And I would think that you would need some sort of a relationship. I, I can't imagine just calling up. If, if I live in Londonderry, and um, there are a few non-private schools in, in my area, but um, someone that I don't even know who knows me, doesn't know my child, I'm going to call them up out of the blue and ask them to to sit with me and talk. I mean, I would think there would be some concern about that. <clears throat> I think I understand, but part of my problem is I don't understand how it functions now. I mean, uh, there are people all over the state who are successfully doing this. Yeah. And, and apparently they call someone they know who calls someone they know who calls someone they know. It doesn't seem like it would be an issue. The issue that I see that you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. seems to be the one of somebody reporting to someone yeah. that this family is not going to be uh, in public school. Um, and, and maybe that is one of the issues that the commission needs to look at. Right. That's why it, it seems that this is getting a little more complicated because we're trying to solve the problem and, and we're kind of reaching around where we don't really have a lot of information um, really here. I find it very problematic that this this now this one year period where you're going to give them time to correct if the child is not meeting the standard. I, I That's believe it's already in statute. It's already in statute. If it is, I have a problem with that because aren't you holding the homeschoolers to a higher standard than what we hold our our uh, public school kids to? <laughs> yeah, you are. Well, but that's in existing statute. I know, and, so and I find that, that to be problematic. That why would be would another we, thing that the commission Right, why would we to? hold homeschoolers to a higher standard than what we hold our, pri our public school kids to? I, I, I didn't I'm write just, this legislation. The only thing <laughs> I'm I just looking at this, I'm going, The commission is going to have a plate full when they sit down. Right, and that's, that's and my argument. And it's about argument. time they had the plate in front of us. In front of them. That's why, th thank you, Representative Dunn. You've just made my argument. And, <laughs> You know, I, I understand what Representative Rouse is trying to do where she sees that there's some problems and she wants to take care of those problems. But my concern is, okay, we'll take care of the problems, but is the cure going to be worse than the problem? We've got to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And in order to do that, we might need some time to really take a look at these and really make sure that what's on the books is, is correct. 
and it's something that everybody can live with. That, that's just my argument. I'm, I, I don't I understand, know, but... Uh, maybe I didn't put it correctly. Or No, I think we've said the same thing, yeah, but I don't it, understand your comment about what Representative Rouse is trying to do. And, I think she's trying to find a solution to, to the problem about um, about not having plans, and, and she's, she's, she's trying to fix that situation. And, and I give her credit for trying to do it. She's, she's trying to get everybody, she's listening to everybody, and she's trying to come together, bring together a solution. Um, but I think that there's so many unknown variables to this that we just are not aware of. And we have to be very careful about what we're doing. So that's why I created the commission that would give it time to take a look at everything. And that way we can come up with a solution that everyone can live with. Let, let me kind of Yes. Uh, let, let me just address your initial comment about who they would meet with and would it be someone they've never had any contact okay. with before. Um, it, as I understand it, homeschoolers have a choice of establishing a relationship either with the Department of Education, their mm -hmm. own home district, or with a private mm -hmm. school. And they all need to do that no matter mm -hmm. what. And okay. um, in the case of the private school, I think sometimes they pay for that supervision. They correct? do? Okay. Yeah. So, those relationships are in place. Okay. If it turned out that there was no one they felt comfortable talking with, then they would probably choose the other option. They would choose the written plan. Okay. But then again, they have to submit a written plan to someone that either they <coughs> don't know or... Well, we're talking about accountability and some kind of oversight okay. here. I'd like to ask... You know, if... Yeah. Okay. No, no, I understand. I, I understand what you're trying to accomplish. I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Thank you. Um, who initiates the meeting? Um, in, is it the parent who is the uh, driver of that? So either the parent submits a plan or the parent requests a meeting. Yes. Okay, it just wasn't clear. I wanted to clarify that. Um, do you... I'm looking at the effective date of this, and it's July 1st of 2008, so basically a couple months away, mm -hmm. and I wonder what the impact will be upon the local districts or the non-public, particularly if we're asking for um, meetings to take place with them. Um, we all know what the schools are like, and when the elementary school, my kids just go, had 875 kids in it. Um, how would you feel about making the effective, the effective date of the legislation with the exception of the plan and notification piece remain as it is and put the plan and notification piece off for July 1st of 2009? I mean, much as we did with the, um, much as we did with the uh, dropout bill, a uh, time for people to adjust to it. That way the notification can go into place, the commission can start working, and then everybody's on notice that they're going to have to start working on a plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly not unreasonable. Um, one thing that was discussed was that as the commission does meet, if it does turn out that there are some glitches in this legislation, they can certainly deal with them. As we can with anything. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, my, my feeling is that there has been a lot of dialogue already around mm -hmm. this issue. I think we could try to move forward with it. But okay, so you're suggesting a different um, effective date for that piece. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay. <coughs> yeah, I'd like to hear what these folks have to say first. Other comments? Go ahead. I have a couple. First, I want to thank um, Representative Rouse for such a thoughtful um, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for for putting the work that you have into it. I just have a, a couple questions. Um, on, the, on the first page, um, and I don't think we meant, meant this, but if you, in section 1A, um, where you have the case of the five days of commencing the program, um, grace period for, let's say, an emergency situation, it, it looks like it's contradictory to 5A. Um, down at the bottom where it says prior to the initial year of a home education program a parent shall provide to the Department of Ed. Um, so I'm not sure what, what you meant to 
how you meant to deal with that one. Um, we actually discussed that uh, in legislative services, and I thought that the fact that it says within 30 days of notification answered the problem. So tell me exactly which line it talks about commencement of the program. So um, you have in 1A, um, on line 15, right. Okay, you have yeah. the that, that's days. for that emergency right. Right, situation. And right. then um, down on line um, 28. Prior to, to the, the initial, initial year. year. And that's generally where you'll days. find that case, right? Where somebody's being pulled out of public school or private school or whatever. Summarizes a plan of instruction um, at the time notification is made or 30 days within. So we have to change that prior to yeah. the phrase mm -hmm. because yep. it contradicts actually the end of that. Paragraph. Right, okay. right, right, right. Okay. Yep. And then um, I, I'm not sure. I I think I I heard you right, but um, 5B, where it starts on line 33, was it your intent to require both um, um, curriculum material as well as you know such as a plan as well as a meeting, or in the no. alternative a meeting? As an alternative. Okay, as an alternative. Okay, could. Now, but let me ask you. Yeah. What you're asking about curriculum material. Well, well, it just says um, in 5A, I didn't mean to say curriculum, information which summarizes a plan of supervised instruction. That could be, you know, in the form of a letter, it could be, you know, a dissertation, it could be, yeah. you know, what, whatever. Um, um, so I, I wasn't sure because it didn't really state in B that uh, it could be, because you had on line one of the second page, a parent shall meet um, versus may in the alternative meet. Well, the reason, yeah, I actually crossed that out once and then put shall back because I had had or at the end of the other. Mm -hmm. um, or of the end of, okay, I got it. Or, or all right. Um, okay, all right. Um, yeah, so I and, was thinking about that. And then um, was there any thought to um, perhaps stating at the end on line five, um, to um, suggesting that such meeting could occur via teleconference or in person. Just thinking the fact that, um, you know, the homeschool support group that um, I'm a part of has almost 1,500 kids in it. And they're mostly within uh, Manchester, Auburn, Londonderry, um, Nashua. Um, and, and it is going to be yeah. a significant, uh, on the non-public schools as well as the, for local public schools, a significant thing, and I'll, I'll just tell you that um, in most cases, the, the help for 5A and even 5B occurs within, for the large majority, 98% I would say, of the parents get expert help from parents that have been homeschooling for years and years and years, face-to-face um, -face help, <laughs> oftentimes, um, you know, pulling out curriculum, pulling out books, showing them the difference in learning styles and so forth. Um, so it, it would be um, a, uh, you know, a, a significant burden added to the, to the school districts and non-public schools without, I think, a lot of gain because we do a lot of it. There are, though, I will tell you, um, with one of the private schools I was working with, um, one of them, um, I was telling Re Representative Casey after the meeting, one of the principals actually made it a requirement that if you wanted to use them as a participant agent, you had to meet. Um, with them because he, was, he just uh, felt as though as an educator he wanted to make sure he understood who he was you know doing that with and if you chose them as a PA that was one of the things you did right um, but not everybody needed that not everybody wanted it and there there are a couple percentage of uh, people that ask to meet with the school administrator and they do um, but the rest of them get it from um, by and large from the homeschool support groups um, that here. There was actually discussion mm -hmm. within the subcommittee about, you know, some way to link people up with those support groups yeah. to make okay. sure every, I mean, yeah. we even talked about some kind of requirement. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it might, some sort of a reporting where they do notify within the, the five days and it's like, okay, this, these are the homeschool resources in your area and just help yeah. facilitate that well, relationship. I think that would be excellent and I because think that then we, a, could con we yeah. could proactively, which right. we often do when we find out, yeah. this, you know, we'll, my wife will, somebody will pick up the phone and say, hey, yeah. can I help you? Mm -hmm. um, 
I, that think, would be I a, think that's a beyond the scope of what right, we're doing right here. Right. That would be something that we would work on in, in the commission, is okay. to set up some sort of a way for people to communicate with each other um, and to help facilitate that yeah. process. The, the other thing I was, I'm sorry, um, the, was that you, Roberta? Go ahead. I just had a, a point. <laughs> sorry. The Homeschool Coalition does a wonderful job yes. with outlining um, mm -hmm. areas in different regions where people can contact people. Right. I, and I believe that you had testified to that yeah. earlier. Um, and, and I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, again, I think there's a lot of things that we can work on together and bring everybody to the table. I would have liked to have seen um, Mark Joyce here from the school superintendents to get his take on, you know, what the school superintendents as an association think about this. And they might have some ideas about what to do. I can't call on anybody. I'm not the, oh, I'm I'm not the head cheese here. I just, kind of, I just kind of spaced out. I just had a couple other <laughs> okay. things to point out for you. But, uh, you know, My Roberta understanding finished. was that Mark Joyce testified in favor. Yes, of he did. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, the other thought that I had behind um, 5A and 5B was that um, but prior to HB 406, as you know, um, the rules stipulated exactly what a parent had to sub submit. It could be a table of context, it could be curriculum, and everybody did faithfully. Um, well, most people did faithfully, unless they were put on probation. Um, and we're, we were talking amongst ourselves, and even the, the letter that Chris handed out for your information as an example of the pre-HB 406 stuff that mm -hmm. moved, right? Um, even though it wasn't, you know, bulletized, it was a good description. We just never really found that anybody ever read them. Um, and you could always turn to say, yeah, it was done, but um, I just, I really don't know what it's going to solve for you, only because I, I honestly don't think the schools have time um, to do it. I mean, my response to that is what I, it has been all along, but even the exercise of doing it, if there's any thought that goes into it, if it's not just sort of hand, handing in something someone else did or, you know, just a rote copy the table of contents, if there's any thought at all that that's a worthwhile exercise. But that's also the reason that there's the other option there. Right? Yeah. As Representative Price mm -hmm. suggested, maybe the discussion the is more for mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, and then bot 6A, um, the only question I have, and you mentioned it on Monday, but I'm not sure it was actually addressed here. I think you, you wanted to have it addressed was, let's say you have an experienced homeschool family and their youngest comes up compulsory attendance age. I, I didn't think you meant for that experienced parent to have to do the stuff of an initial year, but it, it's not really clear to me in there that um, they're exempted because there's no history of performance from the 40th percentile or any other mm -hmm. and I'm not really sure that, that so the, a rogue yeah. superintendent wouldn't say I want it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So <laughs> this, this was um, uh, sure. if I might. Th this was an area that I think the drafting attorney had some questions about as okay. well. And okay. the intent was that no child in that family would have to submit uh, there would no not need to be a plan for any child in that family unless there had been, I guess, in the previous year, I mean, what would be the best way to do that, a problem with evaluation? Well, uh, although I have to say that I have some doubts about that because every child is different, and I'm sure you'd agree with that, and, yeah. the, and the plan would not be the same for every child, but right. what we've but done is demonstrate that we're capable of thinking right. through a plan. Exactly. Okay. Right. That's all. And then, Wait, the last comment. I'm sorry. I, just yeah. wanna, I have something else in that area because I had that exact same question. But also, um, Emma, yes. this, this is really to you and the drafters. This whole piece about the, you know, if they fail to meet the criteria, evaluation criteria, mm -hmm. does that apply only to the one child? Because again, I mean, we just said it, every no. child. So you're going to have a parent with four children, and one child fails to meet adequate progress. I don't think that they should have to go and do a plan for every single child. Um, so that's an area that just needs, to, I think, from my opinion, needs to be tightened up. I'm still evaluating the impact of this whole thing. So, mm -hmm. but well, as you should be. <laughs> yeah, as you should be. But it sounds like you're suggesting that the plans would only be required for the child for whom. Um, I, I think I was thinking that if they had it, if there was a child and the evaluation results 
were not satisfactory and then a new child came into the program, shouldn't, I mean, even if they hadn't had unsatisfactory evaluation of results, but it's a new child, shouldn't there have to be a plan for that child? I don't think so. I mean, as, you, as we all said and we all know, any one child can just be um, um, performing to their own ability. Every child's ability mm -hmm. is different. So that one child may not be capable of Unable to certain certain circumstances where the child is ill or in the hospital or something. I mean, there are, are dozens of things that could happen. I, I just don't like the idea that if one child isn't doing well, all every, every, it's like again mass punishment. Everybody, you have to do the whole thing for everybody else. I I, I don't agree that that's a good thing to be doing. Well, I, I guess I would turn this back to the parents right. and ask them what they think is reasonable in this case. The, the only thing I'll, I'll yield if you're okay. Um, but um, if you're familiar, I'm not sure if you are, with any of the standardized tests and, and how they, they caution the parents and the test takers. One, that the child should be tested in their, in their normal learning environment. It's classroom, classroom, home, home. Whatever it is, they perform best. Second, in most cases, they warn you that it is a trend that you should be looking for. So that, especially Iowa Basic Skills Test, which is a good standardized test, Stanford Achievement, some of those, when you look at the first year that a kid takes a test, um, you know, my daughter was not so hot on, on math, but she excelled in some of the others. The following year, there was progress, right? I saw her jump from like, you know, it was 35 up to 50. And, and I said, wow, you know, some of her, her thinking skills are coming up, some of her, you know, all, all those things. And, I, and again, I'm thinking about, I'm more worried about not exception homeschoolers as I am, exception superintendents who look at this, don't look at it, or are looking for a reason with a predisposed idea of what should or shouldn't be and say, and call them on the carpet and now the whole family is on probation. Um, it, there's just so yeah, that's, many. That's a leap from saying the whole family does a plan. That's not that they're on Well, probation. in their mind, um, it's the next step. Um, especially if you have a predisposition about homeschooling, there's a lot of opinions out there, as you know, about what homeschooling is and how it should be run. Um, even on the Board of Education, um, the State Board, there's a huge continuum of understanding. Um, so I would, I would just caution you there, um, because first, um, the 40th percentile is a very high um, standard, and I would love to see if we tested all of our public school students in New Hampshire today, um, what, it, what it would be. NECAP is not a good um, example of what you would see on standardized tests, and there's there's commentary on ECAP all over the web um, that it is a substandard test. So I would love to see the same standardized test provided to public school students and then see what kind of percentile they come up with. But the key is trend, right? Um, you want to see educational progress being made, and it's not a 12-month thing. It's a year-to-year -year thing. That's all. Yeah, good. I was looking at the uh, par it's paragraph 5b and notice that the conversation or meeting would be with the superintendent or principal of a non-public school. And I wondered if that language might be made more consistent with the same four options that are in the law now on the evaluation end. Because right now we have four participating agent choices that are written into the law, and here there are two of those. So I wonder if it would make sense to have the same uh, people that, that we're already accustomed to working with as our choice for notification uh, and perhaps this discussion about the curriculum. So rather than have to go to a public school or non-public school if our participating, participating agent was a certified teacher or tutor or something, uh, would it make more sense for that to be the same four options? I'm not comfortable with that, Jim, because I think that then there is no more, for lack of a better word, official kind of connection between the homeschool family and the education community. And I mean, I understand that from your perspective, that's a good thing. <laughs> and from my perspective, it's not a good thing. Um, I did this language so that it was consistent with the, with the language in the notification. 
um, statute, and you're, or the proposed the proposed statute, and you're suggesting that both the notification and this plan should include the option of just presenting to a tutor or a consultant, right? If they're qualified to do the evaluation. If they're legally uh, qualified to assess the home I, school. I, I believe that at some point the district needs to know where kids are. And I don't see any other way for them to know it if there's no notification. I, I'm sorry, Sharon had her hand up. No, no that's okay. No, um, sure. When children are, are to have their annual evaluation and their testing, who, do, who does the, the results of that testing go to? Their participating agency. The partici and that can be? You mean ultimately? Ultimately. Yeah, the participating agency. Okay, what so what does that mean? What does that well, in, by law in New Hampshire, you can choose the Department of Ed, okay. Roberta's team. You could choose your resident local school district, your superintendent, okay. right? Or you could pick a non-public school that is acting as a participating agency. So the things that are listed. Okay. So it could be a private school that has decided to act as that. Okay. So, uh, so, I'm, so this language is consistent. With it that. is, okay. <clears throat> If, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of this here, um, if you choose to have a certified teacher or, um, or, or someone else, the other, the other folks that you had talked about, how do, how do they play into all of this? Um, you're, you're paying them to do a service for you, I imagine, but how are they being held accountable, if you want to use that word, to the Department of Education or the districts or, or anyone else? Or are they? Does that make sense? Because I'm trying to figure out how this, how, how these folks that are the certified teachers and, and all these other folks that you go to, how they fit into the picture here and why they wouldn't be included in someone that you can report to. If you're already using them now, if you, if you mean in, in, in terms of evaluation, right, a parent right. can choose a standard, a nationally standardized right. test. Okay. They can choose an evaluation by a certified teacher or a teacher that's currently teaching in a non-public school. Okay. Or they can um, use the local school district and, and their standardized test, whatever test they're using. Right. Or a form that both the participating agency and the parent agree is commensurate with agent, okay. you know, that will measure commitment agent abilities, so like in a special needs case. Um, so in the case where a parent um, chooses a certified teacher, um, that would be, at that point, they would have a relationship. So you'd have to specify that um, um, in the case where a parent um, wants to be able to submit to a certified teacher, they must use that certified teacher for evaluation as well, mm -hmm. or something like that. And then you'd be consistent with what I think um, Representative Rouse was trying to accomplish um, okay. there. May I follow up, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. I'm trying to figure this out here. <laughs> if that's what you mean. Yeah, I think it is. And so when a child takes one of the standardized tests, yeah. do the results eventually end up at the Department of Education? No. No. Those are, there's privacy issues with that and there's, and also, there is no need for them to because um, the department is not acting in the role of participating agent in that case. So, if your participating agent is a non-public school principal, mm -hmm. they're the ones that are going to get the testing scores. By law, right. By law. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Sometimes I feel as though we're peeling an onion. That's why, <laughs> that's why I'm arguing for the commission because this is so multi-layered. It, it really we is. really yeah. don't, I mean, I can't sit here and say I have a good grasp on all of this because I don't. I think we're going to have to count on the commission doing right, and that's a lot more work for a year. For, for quite a while to try and figure, figure this out and, and come up with something everyone can, can live with. Thank you. I, I have a concern about the commission and the makeup of the commission on page three. Um, one member from, uh, let's see, line 33 and 34 of this, or 33 and 35 list the uh, two homeschooling groups, but there is actually a third homeschooling group okay. on, represented on the Home Education Advisory Council, and they're omitted from here, and I think, you know, the, the Catholics United for Home Education, C-U-H-E. They have had a representative on the council since 1990. 
Catholics United for Home Education. And May I respond, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. The reason they, I, I didn't, I went through and I looked at who gave testimony. Right. Um, the major, the major folks that came right. and testified. So, um, on the commission, you do have um, someone from the. Um, uh, I, I think there's a member from the um, advisory council. So I would think that they would be represented with that, un unless you feel that they deserve a, a seat. I, I, I. I'm, I'm not a member of that group, but um, okay. I know that that group has been represented from the, from the very beginning. They were always considered to be three major homeschooling groups, uh, representing three different segments, the Christian Home Educators, the, the New Hampshire Homeschool Coalition, which is a non-sectarian group, and the, um, and the Catholics United for Home Education, a whole separate you know, constituency, as it were. And I think they would feel discrimination against probably. <laughs> well, I don't have a problem. Certainly it was an oversight. Of yeah, it was, no, it was I, a, I, an oversight I, I, on I, my no, part. No doubt about that. It's not, it's just, yeah. No, it was an oversight oh, on my part. The commission seems to get bigger. There was so much testimony to go through. Yeah. <laughs> so there were actually, if I missed there them, there were actually okay. There were actually people there who, who were members of that group and, and testified, but okay. they didn't they they did identify, identify themselves. Yeah, they yeah. did not As identify. I don't, I don't have a problem, Mr. Chairman, with amending it and, and putting that in. That's fine. Think so. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I think we need to have everybody at the yeah, table. You're right, I do. Legitimate discussion. Right, I, I mean, do. this onion needs to be peeled. And, uh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Somebody's going to cry a lot. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> no. I guess I'll leave that alone. Yeah. Yeah, Rupert. Um, I, I want to, I mean, all of this is, um, you know, a terrific look at what home education is doing. And, and um, it's a significant um, portion, certainly, of what we do in public education. In, in what option is available to New Hampshire students. Um, I want to go back to the original um, initiative that um, was presented, and that was to just have a plan the first year that you're home educating, which seems to me a very simple concept and is a lot less um, than what used to be before 406, and it just asks for one year that the homeschool people um, and students and families were used to that. Um, and um, people agreed that after they did it once, it would probably be efficient to not do it. So it's not, I mean, we, we've talked about how complicated this is, but in some ways um, we've made it more complicated. And then co to come back to the, the final evaluation, in the evaluation when the standardized tests are taken, there is um, something that, that we have talked about on the Home School Advisory Committee that's concerned me that I would love to have a part of this discussion. And that is that this state sets no requirements about who administers a test. So that any one of those tests could come to a home. They can do it in an untimed way. They could do it over days and then send it back to the testing company. And in a lot of states, it says administered by a certified teacher or the test conditions be um, those of what the test is. And that, that is a normally accepted practice with home education. And then the third thing I wanted, uh, with the question <coughs> generally, is that tests conditions exist. Um, so I think that's a little disquieting sometimes to educators that there aren't normal conditions asked of by the, by the state. Um, and then the third thing is that if there are non-compliant with the law, um, superintendents, whatever out there, it's our job to help them to understand that they are not in compliance with what the law is. And, and you know, that's what we do. And I don't think we have a lot of, I mean, uh, contention. This, this particular home education statute is mature now. In the beginning days, maybe there was some, but um, there hasn't been. And I know that the school districts have asked for the support of having a plan the first time. They've asked you for that. The department's asked you for that. So, um, I guess I would respectfully disagree. We know that there's a large turnover in the SAUs. And almost every year, we hear from homeschoolers that their district has a new person in it who doesn't know the home education law and doesn't know how to administer it. It's, it's, not, it, it's not a question of, yes, there are a lot of people out there who do understand, but there also are a lot every year coming in who don't. Chris, that's one of the problems with education, is that um, <coughs> students turn over, teachers turn over in every way that we deal with education. We're in the process of educating people about what it is they're supposed to do. That's the what. Mm -hmm. We live in a, in a very 
um, you know, fluid situation in education. We have to help kids that are going into the fifth grade <coughs> know what they should know. We have to help new teachers be mentored. We have to have new superintendents understand the circumstances. And if that, you know, on the Home School Advisory Council, there are limited numbers of times when we have that problem that comes to us. Representative okay. Rouse. Um, Roberta, you know, in the in your thinking about getting back to the simplicity of the initial proposal, I think the complexity arose because of questions that were asked about that simple proposal. So, in your mind, when the suggestion, when the bill initially proposed a one-time plan, did you envision that it, it was a one-time for the entire family, or did you think successive children would need to? I, you know, I I am happy with the one. I was always happy with the notion that it would be one-time family plan. Once you figure out how to do home education, and once you have access to all the resources that are available, and then you're, you know, you're, yeah. there's a solid foundation in which we can, everybody can feel comfortable. I mean, the state, you know, the legislature has a compelling interest to be sure that things run fairly well. Um, and we're not perfect, and we're never going to be, because there are always going to be people that have to learn. There are going to be new home educators, there are going to be new superintendents. Um, and those of us in the advisory committee try to address those issues. I know my phone is, is fairly full of people that have simple questions to move on, and that's sort of what we're supposed to be doing, is helping them. Do you think that the specific language about um, flexibility or approval is a helpful addition or not? I, 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 I'm satisfied that's with okay. all of this. I think this is... Um, <laughs> and what's your feeling about the alternative of the face-to-face -face discussion? You know, it gives people who um, want an opportunity to discuss that opportunity, but they don't have to do it. And if people find that burdensome, they can just do a plan. They can write out what it is they want. They don't have to avail themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I think it's a, it's a it's a nice option for some parents who might want it. Okay. Going back to Jim, and then I'll move on because he's been with you. <laughs> One thing that occurred to me when we spoke about the the committee, the Home Education Advisory Council, which is a statutory committee that is provided really to help uh, the department to administer home education, which is their responsibility given to them in law. There are a lot of things that they can do just because of A2, because they're given the responsibility to administer home education. So there are a lot of things that the department uh, is, is able to do and then facilitated with this committee. And what has been reported to me, I, re I appoint two members to that committee, is that there's, uh, in the last couple of years, we haven't really made full use of that committee. Uh, for example, the problems, administrative problems that we even heard on the radio that superintendents brought. Uh, there's not a member on the committee right now that, uh, from the superintendents. There's not a member from the school boards. And the committee has really not been effectual in the last couple of years. And that committee was put in place so that this would all be very simple. Mm -hmm. Those little details of dealing with each of these um, mm -hmm. you know, outlier problems, these people falling through the cracks that we're trying to rescue, uh, there is that mechanism in place, and I just don't think it's been used effectively. So rather than start with new statute, I wonder if we could get back to fully staffing that committee, having them meet every month as, as they used to, uh, and, and try to make better use of the statute uh, as it existed. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to represent Carson first. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My concern, once again, is, is with this idea about the plan and having to submit a plan. Um, it seems that for the a couple of years that this new law has been in effect, no one really came forward and said there were any problems with parents not submitting plans. Um, we heard a lot of testimony of parents said, if you want a plan, I could just download something from the internet and give it to you. And it means absolutely nothing. Um, and you talk about people wanting to sit down and have a discussion with the superintendent. Well, the superintendent of my school district is someone he runs for well, one to do for five schools. Um, when is he going to have? When are you going to have time to do that? Does it have to be done? It says within 30 days. Well, what if he doesn't have time? Or what if you don't have time, or you're trying to juggle schedules? 
We all multitask in our personal lives. We all are juggling with a lot of different things going on. How do you accomplish that? Um, and, and I think that can be problematic. Um, and I think that there are some little issues in there that need to be dealt with. Um, what if you have a superintendent that doesn't want to meet and they can't get in touch with the private school principal? I mean, I really think you're putting people into a box. I think it's a great option. But again, I mean, someone can just say, I got to submit a plan, go to the internet, boom, and that's it. And it means nothing. So it, what you're trying to accomplish really becomes very trivial. And it's just one step someone has to do when you're really not really accomplishing what you really want to do. And again, we didn't hear that it's not working. No complaints came forward other than we think they should be doing it. But again, I, I just. Um, Sorry. Jim, um, at, with the, our, the homeschool advisory committee does meet every month. And in fact, there is a member who meets every month from the school board's association. It's been quite faithful to that meeting. So those are. It's the principals and superintendents that are missing. Yes, yeah. yeah. The superintendent re moved out of state, and we tried to, um, that association has tried to come up with another person. And, actually wanted us to change the date, but the Home School Advisory Committee didn't want to change the date, so that's a discussion that's... For clarification, Jim, I just wanted to ask, um, was your question intended to say that this commission may not be uh, valid because of the... Is that where you were going? Well, it? it seems the makeup of the commission is very similar to the makeup of the committee that was put in this in statute in 1991, and I, I do think it's very it could be very productive and probably should be done, especially uh, prior to enacting a legislation. Because my gosh, good morning.